opportunity to put his soldiers to work. When a farmer discovered Argentiferous galena, rich in silver, he showed it to Colonel Connor. In 1863, Connor, along with the discoverers, established the West Mountain Mining District and the Jordan Mine in what would later be called Bingham Canyon. He also dispatched soldiers in many directions in further search of precious metals. Connor openly solicited outside prospecting in his Union Vedette newspaper and reported great mineral finds in Utah. He felt this would be a way to attract non-Mormons or the Gentile and loosen the Mormon's hold on the land. It was at this time, and assumedly from Connor's reports of great mineral wealth, that President Lincoln made the statement, Utah would yet become the treasure house of the nation. Whatever his motives, Patrick Connor has been called the father of Utah mining. In 1864, the 2nd Cavalry at Camp Floyd discovered rich deposits of silver on the west slope of the Ochre Mountains, east of Rush Valley. By 1865, 500 claims had been located, and by 1869, the gold camp of Lewiston, later named Merker, boasted 1,200 residents. Before the mining camps were connected to rail transportation, high-grade ore was shipped to San Francisco via mule or freight wagon. It was then shipped on sailing vessels bound for the British Isles where it was processed at Swansea, Wales. Returning clipper ships used Danish pebbles as ballast, and some even made it to Utah as cobblestones. Incredibly, in spite of the distance and time, as long as six months, profits were still realized in the early Utah mining years. Meanwhile, mining continued at Bingham Canyon. Placer gold was discovered. Car Fork, Bear Gulch, and Dampool Gulch provided the richest deposits. Bingham Canyon became the only gold placer operation in Utah, with nearly $2 million recovered through sluicing and panning. At Clay's Bar on Dampool Gulch, the largest gold nugget was discovered weighing in at just over seven ounces. At the prevailing price of $18.65 per ounce, it sold for $128.65. In June of 1868, the Walker brothers freighted copper ore by wagon from Bingham Canyon to Uinta, and then on to Baltimore for processing via the Union Pacific Railroad. This was the first shipment of ore ever to leave the state on the rails. The Walkers gained their first successes in Utah mining by providing goods and services to the miners. One of their early customers was the Emma Mine in Little Cottonwood Canyon. Initially, the ore was rawhided down the canyon and loaded at a rail terminal. Ore was sewn in 100-pound rawhide bags and either slid on the snow or dragged down the mountainside where it was loaded onto wagons for shipment to the railhead. Walker Brothers approached the two struggling partners of the Emma, Chisholm and Woodman, and gave them a $30,000 advance for development in exchange for a quarter interest in the claim. By 1870, the Emma mine had produced $200,000 in silver. At one point, the ore assay reached upwards of $2,000 a ton. The town of Alta's summertime population would swell to over 5,000 residents. Businesses included four clothing stores, five grocery stores, and 15 saloons. The hard life of the mining town, however, took its toll. Many of those not killed in the saloon shootouts were snuffed out in the ever-frequent snowslides. Without warning, 15 and 20-foot deep avalanches crushed dwellings like matchwood. The limited shipments of ore from Little Cottonwood and other districts would soon change as east and west were finally joined by the rails at Promontory in 1869. Narrow gauge spurs were laid into the mining district, speeding up the delivery of ore to west and east coast processing facilities. By 1870, still more new discoveries over the ridge into Big Cottonwood Canyon saw the development of the Prince of Wales group of mines. That same year, William Tecumseh Barbie discovered horn silver on Silverado Hill in Ophir, just north of Merker. It was rich. Some boulders assayed thousands of dollars to the ton. For 10 years, the Silveropolis, Chloride Point, Silver Chief, Mountain Lion, and several other mines would produce millions in silver. 
the Walker brothers shared in this find as well. But their real payday came the following year in 1871, when the Emma, Little Cottonwood's big producer, was sold to an English consortium for $5 million. The Walker's quarter interest represented a handsome return on their initial investment of $30,000. Unfortunately, the sale did not have a happy ending for everyone. Initially, the Emma provided an additional $5 million in silver to its English owners. But at the 300-foot level, the vein simply disappeared. As quickly as the rich find made a few wealthy, it was gone. During this period, ever-eager prospectors discovered and mined silver in American Fork Canyon. $8 million in silver and lead would ultimately be wrested from the steep canyon's grasp. Prospectors advanced over the ridges from the Cottonwood Canyons into Lake Flat, the first settlement above present-day Park City, then called Parley's Park, after the Mormon apostle Parley P. Pratt. Some say Rufus Walker and Ephraim Hanks discovered it in 1868, while others claim it was Connor's soldier miners in 1869. But whoever it was, the word was out. The prospectors moved in. Parley's Park really began its rise to becoming the West's greatest silver camp with the discovery of the Ontario claim. Rector Steen was a prospector who had already participated in the Bingham Canyon and the Cottonwood Canyon discoveries as a civilian with Connor's soldiers. He was camping at Steen Spring with three fellow prospectors. It was July, 1872. R.C. Chambers, an agent for George Hurst of Comstock Mining fame, was checking out mining claims below the flagstaff. He had heard of Steen's discovery and came to inspect for himself. How's the dig going? Well, we're doing the CP. We're just sticking around in that real time. Turn That's it over. That's where you're getting out of there? That's it. Steen's high-grade samples were impressive. It was apparent to Chambers that Steen was into high-grade silver ore. He made an offer to purchase on the spot. Within the week, Steen and his friends sold the Ontario claim to Chambers for $27,000. The Ontario mine would come to yield over $50 million in metal value, a healthy addition to the fabulous Hearst fortune and empire. The discoveries continued. As Park City, Ophir, Merker, Alta, and Bingham increased their mining activities, Chintik Valley began to reveal her wealth. Earlier, in December of 1869, a piece of surface ore, float as it is called, was discovered by George Rust. The outcropping of ore was illuminated by the glint of the sun and was appropriately named the Sunbeam Mine. Within months, the Black Dragon, Mammoth, and Eureka Hill were located and staked. The camps of Diamond, Silver City, Eureka, and Mammoth quickly developed. The Tintic District would eventually blossom into the second largest producer in the state. Miners and their families began moving into the area in the 1870s. They were predominantly German, Irish, Welsh, and Cornish immigrants, skilled in hard rock mining techniques. And still other mining camps began to spring up. This is the portal of the Cobb Mine here at Silver Reef, once a booming, bustling silver mining town just north of St. George. This place is a honeycomb of shafts and adits and tunnels, all dug over 100 years ago. The amazing thing about Silver Reef is that according to the experts, silver just isn't found in sandstone. But they found it. Within 10 years, they had taken more than $9 million, or in today's exchange, $35 million worth of silver, right out of these sandstone rocks. It is called Silver Reef because a reef or escarpment of white sandstone sits in this beautiful valley, surrounded by these amazing red sandstone cliffs, familiar to St. George. Its discovery is just as intriguing. As usual, there is more than one account, but two are worthy of mention. 
The first is that a traveler, while warming himself by the fireplace at his friend's home in the early Mormon settlement of Leeds, noticed that the white sandstone was weeping droplets of pure silver. He traced the sandstone to its quarry and staked a claim. The more probable tale is that of John Kemple, a longtime mineral prospector. While staying at his friend Orson Adams' home in Harrisburg, he walked through the area and observed the green malachite and blue azurite, copper-bearing minerals which form distinctive and beautiful fossils within the white sandstone ledges. What really got Silver Reef up and going was William Tecumseh Bobby. In 1874, the Walker brothers sent him to follow up on reports of silver and sandstone at Harrisburg and Leeds. Despite his favorable report to the Walkers, they declined involvement, and he in turn staked his own claim. The first ore was shipped in December from the Tecumseh claim. The stampede to Silver Reef was officially begun. Perhaps the richest concentration of silver in the state was located in the San Francisco mountains west of Milford. In September 1875, two prospectors, Jim Ryan and Sam Hawks, noticed a peculiar boulder. After chipping off a hunk, they discovered it was nearly pure silver and could be cut with a knife. They staked a claim, called it the Bonanza, and sold it for $25,000 in cash. The new owners named it the Horn Silver Mine because the silver chloride curled like an animal's horn when cut with a knife. The owners discovered that the boulder was an outcrop or the apex of a vein of high-grade silver ore. Within weeks, they sold it to Jay Cook, owner of the Great Northern Railroad, for five million dollars. The Horn Silver Mine would eventually produce over 50 million dollars worth of silver ore. The richness of the mine spawned an instant boom town. These kilns were built to produce charcoal for the smelters. Houses and stores sprang up. Frisco would soon be dubbed the wildest town in the West with more saloons than any other business. Shootings were a nightly event. In desperation, Marshall Pearson of Pios, Nevada was finally enlisted to clean up the town. He made his policy clear the first day. He would have no jail, make no arrests, and there would be no bail or appeals. Outlaws were given two choices, get out or get shot. The first night, he killed six men. In 1885, the mining came to an abrupt halt. With a groan and a huge shudder felt 15 miles away, the mine caved in from the bottom up. It happened just after the night shift was hoisted to the surface. No one was injured, but the productive days of mining in Frisco were over. What began abruptly as a boom town ended just as abruptly. Ironically, in the pursuit of timber for shoring up mine edits and cross ties for the advancing rail lines, another mining industry was spawned. Better quality coal was discovered by timber cutters high above Schofield at winter quarters, so named because loggers were forced to spend a winter there in 1870. In May of 1874, the Fairview Coal Mining and Coke Company was incorporated, the first of several high-quality coal mines in Carbon and Emory counties. Before we get further into this story, it might be helpful to understand mining terminology. I think most of us are familiar with open pit mining as we look at the world's largest on the west side of the Salt Lake Valley. It is called load mining when it is removed from underground in ore bodies and placer mining when it is taken from the surface, such as with a gold pan or in a sluice run. Coal mines differ somewhat in terminology from that of hard rock mining, such as a Park City silver mine. You would not want to be embarrassed by saying tunnel when it is really an adit, or shaft when it should be winds, and so forth. One could spend a lot of time here, but let's just cover the basics. When a mineral is to be removed, it is accessed by either sinking a shaft, which is vertical, or driving an adit, which is a horizontal passageway into the mine and has only one opening to the surface. If it was connected by two openings to the surface, it would be called a tunnel. In spite of this technicality, adits are still called tunnels. Let's assume that we think there is something inside the mountain based on scientific or geologic hunches. Ore veins can be fickle. We sink a shaft, 
and at a certain level establish a level or station. In order to access the shaft, we build a head frame from which a hoist cable lowers us into the shaft. This has also been called a gallows frame. Its shape kind of gives that away. After driving a level, we may decide to branch off to the side, and that becomes a drift. A drift usually follows a vein of ore. When an ore body is located, it is called a stope, and we stope the ore when we remove it. If the ore vein rises or falls, we may follow it with an incline or a decline. When a shaft is driven on the interior to either connect adits or access ore bodies, it is called a raise. When it is an internal shaft equipped with a hoist, it becomes a wind. I'm sure this is all very clear to you now. In the case of coal mining, we most often enter the mine from a horizontal opening or the portal and follow the seam of coal, which is generally 4 feet to 16 feet thick in Utah. In the early days, coal was extracted by following whatever was easiest to take, and the roof was shored up with timbers, sometimes as high as 30 feet. Today, a series of parallel entries are driven with cross cuts connecting every 80 feet. 20-foot wide cuts are taken, leaving 60-foot square pillars to support the roof in the seam of coal. Hard rock miners would refer to the roof as the back. In either coal or hard rock mining, the ore or coal body being worked is called the face. Therefore, you work at the face with either a roof or back overhead, a floor underneath, and ribs to form the sides. When an advance in a coal mine is exhausted, a calculated retreat is made and pillars are removed or pulled as the mining team works in reverse. As the ground above, or the overburden, settles, it is called subsidence. In a coal mine, you work with coal cars. In a hard rock mine, you use ore cars. In a hard rock mine, you drill and shoot the face. And then remove or muck the shattered material. In years past, it was hauled by horses or mules in ore cars on rails to where it was hoisted to the surface. Coal mine has worked much the same way, but today it is removed by mechanical means where it is conveyed with continuous haulage or on conveyor belts to loadouts or the tipple. It is then loaded again onto trucks or train cars and transported to its final destination. From the 1870s to the turn of the century, mining camps continued to rise and fall with the announcement of another discovery. In 1880, the census revealed that there were 535 mines operating in Utah. That number would grow even more. This mining map indicates the current number of mine sites in the state. Most of these are no longer in operation. In the same census, Silvery, for instance, boasted 1,146 residents. Of that number, 11 were Utahns. The balance came from 27 states and 18 foreign countries. One of the more colorful ethnic groups was the Chinese. They ran the services, most often the restaurants, the laundries, and the boarding houses. One humorous recollection was their funeral services. As the procession made its way east of the Catholic cemetery, the local Indians, attracted by the wailing, waited in the draw just a short distance away. After the service, the Indians would come and help themselves to the food delicacies left behind for the recently departed. It may be the first recorded case of Chinese takeout. In the 10-year productive life of Silver Reef, some 250 Chinese were buried here, but you will find no graves today. A San Francisco Chinese businessman had them exhumed and shipped to China to be reburied in their homeland. Each mining district had its unique personality and often very unique story. According to the 1881 P.O.T. record, it was 1875 at the Thompson McNally mine in Silver Reef that one of the more unbelievable events occurred. Two miners, Henry Freudenthal and Louis Hassel, 
were putting a hole into bare rock when suddenly the entire face of the drift before them gave way into a black abyss. 200 feet below, seen by candlelight, stood a forest of huge, petrified trees. Many people lowered themselves in to visit the petrified forest cave. The Walker brothers were informed by William Barbie that one tree held 17,000 ounces of silver. Because of the high silver values of the trees, they were removed and processed, thereby destroying perhaps one of the wonders of the world. As Silver Reef peaked in its production in the early 80s, other districts were rising and falling. Ophir started fast and furious in the early 70s, but within 10 years, the shallow ore bodies played out and the 1,200 residents dwindled to 50. Nearby, just over the pass in the South Ochres, Merker also dwindled in about 1880. Interestingly, the same period of time saw very little copper being removed from Bingham Canyon. Copper was more of a nuisance then. In fact, during the placer mining days, miners reported specimens of pure native copper weighing as much as 50 pounds. At less than 12 cents a pound, copper held no magic for the gold and silver seeking prospectors. By the turn of the century, mines and claims were just scratching the surface of the hillside, a faint indication of the enormous wealth to come. A town had been formed in the gulches, and Bingham Canyon was born. The mining activity spawned smelters near the sites and in the Salt Lake Valley. Utah even began to attract ore from out of state. For a short time, ore was freighted from Montana to Utah's northern rail terminal at Corinne. There, it was offloaded to Utah's only paddle wheel steamer and freighted across the Great Salt Lake to be processed, probably in Tooele. Perhaps the quickest rise and fall of a boom town occurred in northern Utah at a place named La Plata, which is Spanish for silver. In July of 1891, a sheep herder high in the hills above Cache Valley picked up a rock and thought it unusually heavy. Its assay in Ogden indicated 400 ounces of silver to the ton. In less than a month, more than a thousand miners were on the scene. The ore was mostly on the surface, and La Plata was billed as the world's only silver placer camp. The ore was shallow, not more than 50 feet deep. When silver prices dropped in 1893, La Plata was no more. It lasted only two years, but not before it yielded $3 million worth of silver and lead. The Utah mountains were virtually alive with prospectors. The Henry and LaSalle Mountains to the southeast, and the Drum, House, and Wawa Mountains to the southwest all had varying degrees of gold and silver. The Deep Creek Mountains had its gold hill. The Tusha Range had its gold mountain. Some of the highest peaks in Utah, Belknap and Delano, exceed 12,000 feet. Part of the Tusha Range is west of Marysville, and in this formidable terrain, Gold was discovered on Tip Top Mountain at nearly 9,900 feet. Here at the caved-in portal of the Tip Top, where it all started, all that remains is this donkey engine and whim used for the hoist in the shaft. It's hard to believe that this heavy equipment was hauled by horse teams up from the valley floor thousands of feet below. Again, the values here never matched other larger producing districts. The Kimberly, Deer Trail, Bully Boy, and the Annie Laurie provided the major activity. Meanwhile, silver and lead continued to be extracted from the big and little Cottonwood and American Fork canyons. But over the hill, silver mining was beginning to grow into what would soon become one of the richest silver districts in the Western Hemisphere. Harley's Park and Lake Flat had turned into bustling Park City. By 1880, the population of Park City had reached about 1,542. By 1890, it would double. The mines virtually dotted the hills. Names like Woodside Gulch, Empire Canyon, and Ontario Canyon. Walker and Webster Gulch, Treasure Hill, and Jupiter Hill would come to signify the locations of the bigger producers. The Ontario became the first major producer. For some time, it was thought that the Ontario Fisher was the only mining camp, and few had the pluck to look elsewhere. 
But John Daly, a miner at the Ontario, theorized that the ore extended west. He struck it and formed the Daly Mine. E.P. Ferry further theorized that if the ore bodies went as far as Daly's property, that they would extend even further. His theory was also correct, and he staked the Anchor Mine. Then came the Daly West, Woodside, Mayflower, Silver King, Sains, Alliance, Crescent, and many others. Water was the first major obstacle in the Park City Mine. Unlike Ophir with no water, Park City had too much of it. The Ontario hit a major flow at 600 feet. Pumps were installed, but struggled to keep up with the flow. A larger pump was needed to access the ore bodies below the 600-foot level. Hearst was familiar with the Cornish pumps at Virginia City, Nevada, where he had made his original stake. He put his California mining engineers onto the water problem. Built in Philadelphia, the famed Cornish pump was shipped piece by piece and installed in 1881 by David Keith, fresh from the Comstock mines of Virginia City. Installed in the Ontario No. 3 shaft, the size of the pump was incredible. The pump rod was made of Oregon pine and was 1,060 feet long and 16 inches square. With the aid of an 1870s blueprint and current computer graphics, we have a graphic knowledge of how the Ontario pump worked. A huge steam piston moved up and down, moving a rocker arm assembly which turned the 70-ton flywheel. The flywheel gear assembly was connected to a counterbalanced pivot arm which moved the wooden piston rod. Collars were installed at the three, six, and 900-foot levels to help stabilize the wooden pump rod. The pump's two 20-inch pistons had 10-foot strokes. They pumped water from the shaft's 1,000-foot level up to the 600-foot drain tunnel level at the rate of 320 gallons with each stroke. That was 2,560 gallons every minute, or 4 million gallons per day. Once understood, the principle is simple enough. The sheer size and dimension, however, make the Ontario Cornish pump a true engineering marvel. It was said that so great was the power of the steam engines which turned the pump that the ground would tremble with each turn of the great flywheel. The Cornish pump allowed the Ontario to mine to depths once thought impossible, and many great and rich ore bodies were opened because of it. Despite its effectiveness, the water was still too much, and the Ontario drain at it was begun three miles away in order to intercept the Ontario's number three shaft at the 1,500-foot level. Today, it is called the Keatley Tunnel. Seven years in its construction, the drain at it, driven from two directions, met perfectly, and so straight was its engineering that daylight could be seen at any point in its entire three-mile length. To offset its cost, ore was found and stoked out along the way. It was later extended an additional two miles. Kind of gives me the willies knowing I'm 1,500 feet below the surface, four miles from the end of the tunnel. I mean the uh, adit. Several other drain adits were driven at other mines to drain off the ever-present aquifer waters. One such adit, driven years later, epitomized the rags-to-riches-to-rags nature of mining. Solon Spiro started digging near the present-day Park City Golf Course. The Spiro Tunnel, as it is called today, extended 14,000 feet. With financial backing from Samuel Newhouse, Spiro extended his adit to 25,000 feet. And finally, with funds exhausted and no ore discovered to offset costs, he ceased operations. In total frustration, he sold his mine to the Silver King Coalition Mining Company. He never found a pound of ore. And to add insult to disappointment, the Silver King mine dug Spiro's great adit just 40 feet deeper and struck a huge body of silver ore. Well, this is what they were looking for. High-grade silver ore. This is the stuff that made millionaires out of 23 Park City miners. But it didn't come easy. When you look at an old mine dump, it represents a lot of human energy. Every shovel full of rock and dirt had to be hand shoveled four or five times. Before pneumatic and hydraulic power drilling equipment was available, 
They simply single or double jack the face by holding a pointed drill and pounding it with either a four or an eight pound sledgehammer. It required about 30 minutes to drill a hole 14 inches deep. A drill was then exchanged for a longer one until the hole was about three feet deep. A planned pattern of holes was drilled in the face and then dynamited. It required five to eight hours just to prepare for a shot. Like any hard rock mining camp, drilling contests soon began. In Park City, the tradition continues today. For most of the state, Labor Day is celebrated along with the rest of the country. In Park City, however, it is called Miner's Day. Imagine working down here with just a candle. Well, before 1912, when the carbide lamp was introduced, a man would just walk into the mine with his lunch pail and three candles, enough for a 10-hour shift. The candle holder was simply uh, hung on a timber or stuck into a crack in the rib. Of course, the candle provided both light and safety because if that candlelight began to flicker, it could mean that the oxygen supply was getting low and it was time to leave the area. Horses were down here as well. The miners called them hay burners. With their legs trussed under their bellies, they were lowered tail first down to underground stables and kept there for up to eight years. The horses, usually stout three-year-olds when they entered, were invaluable in pulling ore cars from the face to the hoist station and back. The horses were later replaced by mechanical horsepower, cars powered by electricity. The completion of the railroad drove many of the immigrant rail workers to the mine camps. Park City attracted its population of Irish mix and cousin Jacks from Great Britain, its Finns and Swedes from Scandinavia, and its Celestials from China. They lived in their own neighborhoods, and their old world ways had a common bond, their underground superstitions. There were tales of a lady in white, or a widow in black, of the ghostly apparition of the man in the yellow slicker. The underground sounds were ever present, and the Cornish miners claimed it was the Tommyknockers, the spirits of departed miners. Supposedly, if you heard the tap, tap, tap of the miner's pick, and you were the only one around, you would be the next to die. Have you heard of the tummy knockers in the deep, dark mines of the West? Which all Cornish miners can hear, and it is no bloody jest. For I'm a Cornish miner, and I'll tell you of it today. Of the tap, tap, tap of a tiny pick as we work in the rock and the clay. We go down in the shafts with our buckets, with arts which nothing phases, each man with a candle to light the way through the drifts and winds and razors and the stale air smells of powder, and the mine is full of sound. But tis only the tap of a knocker that makes our hearts rebound. It's the tap, 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 like sound of tiny liners, just a tap, tap, tap from souls of dead miners. For they're locked in the rock wall, those who find death down there. And tis the tap, tap, tap of tiny picks which makes on end stand our air. So we'll leave the haunted place where we won't work where they be. And wherever we hear their knocking, we sure will always flee. For it means whoever hears it will be the next in line. For the tap, tap, tap of the knockers is our last and awful sign. In reality, the tap, tap, tap were the sounds of small falling rocks, presaging the fall of much bigger rocks. In fact, it was a time to get out. Conditions were tough, but it was a job, and the pay was comparatively good. The miners were most often housed in boating houses. They were charged a dollar a day for room and board. Muckers were paid $2.75, miners $3, and timbermen $3.50 a shift. Payday was once a month. The miners worked 10-hour shifts and had two holidays a year, 
Christmas and the 4th of July. Cooks, bakers, and butchers kept the miners well-fed, providing four meals a day. Before each shift, the miners lined up at a long table piled with sandwiches, boiled eggs, and desserts, and filled their pails. And when work was over, they returned their numbered lunch pails to be washed and laid out for refilling next shift. The Silver King bunkhouse rules cautioned, sociability and good fellowship is encouraged, but loud and boisterous talk, vulgarity, or profanity will not be permitted in the dining room. <laughs> Many of the successful mine owners came from the ranks of the miners. David Keith, Tom Kearns, John Judge, John Daly, and others rose to millionaire status and their mark is still very evident in Salt Lake City today. The numerous businesses and office buildings still reflect their names. Many of the mansions on South Temple, then Brigham Street, are a reminder of their successes. Perhaps the most notable being that of the governor's residence, which was built by Thomas Kearns. The Keith and Kearns partnership with the Silver King was probably the most powerful influence in Park City mining. Many great contributions to Utah came from the dollars in Park City. Perhaps the most flamboyant of the Park City's wealthy was millionaires Susanna, Bransford, Emery, Holmes, Delitch, and Galichev. It seems that a young Park City working girl, Susanna Bransford, married Albion Emery, secretary to R.C. Chambers of the Ontario Mine. With borrowed money, Emery became an owner in the Mayflower Mine. The Mayflower struck it rich and became the Silver King Mine after additional acquisitions on Treasure Hill. The new Silver King Mine was a bonanza. Albion died within a few short years leaving a former seamstress with valuable mining stock. She was a shrewd businesswoman in her own right, as she fought for and held her stock in the Silver King. She later married Colonel Edwin F. Holmes, a wealthy Chicagoan with mining and lumber holdings in Utah and Idaho, and shipping interests on the Great Lakes. With her social standings in the East, she became known as Utah's Silver Queen. Every queen needs a palace, and Colonel Holmes purchased the Gardo House on South Temple from the LDS Church. Brigham Young had originally started the home, purportedly for his favorite wife, Amelia Folsom. It was completed by John Taylor and used as church headquarters for several years. Mrs. Holmes had it decorated for Marshall Fields of Chicago. The Gardo House became known as Amelia's Palace. Following Holmes' death, she married twice more and acquired the additional names. One to a Serbian doctor named Radovan Nedelkov Delic, and later to Prince Nicholas and Galichev from one of the most prominent royal families in Russia. In 1902, her wealth was estimated at $100 million. By 1896, the population of Park City was over 7,000. The town and the mines were doing well. On June 19, 1898, at 4 a.m., fire erupted from Harry Freeman's American Hotel. The sleeping town was awakened with four gunshots and the shrill whistle of the Marsac Mill. By 8 a.m., Park City was no more. Hundreds of cabins and homes, four churches, two banks, a dozen restaurants, 12 saloons, 20 shops, two dozen stores, and five hotels were gone. Everything south of the American Hotel. Fortunately, no life was lost. With little more than a few salvaged items piled in the streets, Park City began to rebuild. The Wanless Saloon was first. It seems that firefighting was thirsty business. Fire was a common enemy with the early mining towns. In the months of May, June, and July of 1879, half of Silver Reef was consumed by four separate fires. 
Eureka had a major fire in 1893 and then almost washed away in the floods of 96. During the 1890s in Merkur, a new process of roasting the ore and using cyanide unlocked the profitable secret of processing the gold-bearing ore. By 1896, the town had grown to 6,000. On January 4th, as statehood celebrations were just beginning, the entire city burned to the ground. The mines were too rich to die. Merkur was rebuilt. By 1902, Merkur had grown to a city of 12,000 with many permanent brick buildings. On June 26th, a careless flame ignited the Preble Hotel. The city burned a second time. Before the ashes cooled, a cloudburst struck and sent flash floods down the burned slopes that wiped away what little was left. This time, Merkur died. Only a handful remained until the last of ore was hoisted in 1913. I'm standing in front of the head frame of the Centennial Eureka Mine, one of the big four of the Tintic Mining District. This mine alone accounted for half a billion dollars in gold, silver, lead, and copper. The head frame, often referred to as the gallows frame because of its obvious shape, was built over a hundred years ago. The 40 and 60 foot spruce timbers were cut down from Norwegian forests and hauled here by boats and by train. The sheer size of this head frame makes the design and construction most remarkable. It was during this time of demise for some mining towns that others began to prosper. The Tintic district came into prosperity in the 90s. Consolidations brought about the big four mining operations, Eureka Hill, Bullion Beck, Centennial Eureka, and the Gemini. By 1892, two railroads served the area, the Union Pacific and the Denver and Rio Grande Western. With the rails came renewed capitalization, and the Tintic District's prosperity soared in kind. Personalities surface when one speaks of Eureka. George Dern started in mining at Merker and successfully mined in Park City and Eureka. His son, George, would later become the sixth governor of Utah. A German immigrant, John Beck, was labeled the crazy Dutchman because of the location of his bullion Beck mine. Geologically, he seemed to be in the wrong place. After striking ore, he built the first church in Eureka. Jesse Knight was an anomaly in mining circles. When he announced the discovery of a claim east of Eureka on Godiva Hill, he was met with a skeptical humbug from his brother-in-law. He therefore filed a claim and named it the Humbug Mine. In debt, he talked two miners into helping him and his son Will to open his claim. The vein in the Humbug Mine was one of the richest lead-silver deposits ever found in the West. With a more seasoned perspective, he acquired other nearby properties and all of them successful. His uncanny ability to locate rich veins at his Iron Blossom, Uncle Sam, Godiva, Colorado, and Mayday Mines was legendary. In the mining camps of Utah, he became known as the Mormon Wizard. Jesse abhorred the use of alcohol by miners, so he built his own town. 65 houses, a school, and a church became his town of Knightsville. Knightsville was the only dry camp or saloon-free camp in Utah and one of only two camps which did not work on Sundays. Knight's condition for employment was that the miner never be found drunk on the job or neglect his family. His properties were disparagingly referred to by some as the Sunday school mines. His workers called him Uncle Jesse. became the chief town of the Tintic district. It was here that J.C. Penney opened his second store. He sold brooms and other household items. The Tintic mining district was incredibly rich. Unlike the Fisher veins of Park City's silver district, the metals were often found in ore chimneys. These columns of ore came right to the surface. Here, next to the Mammoth Hoist House, is the remains of an ore chimney. This glory hole is 110 feet wide and descends for 2,600 feet. The 
miners removed the ore by building timber square sets and following the direction of the chimney. Sometimes the sets extended over 100 feet high, and in some areas, the chimneys are over 300 feet wide. In some respects, it was easy mining. One simply followed the ore chimney and removed the ore. The depth and width, however, made the task most formidable. In some places, the ore was so rich, it almost defied description. In 1907, the Mammoth Mine reported a high-grade portion of the mine at the 1,400-foot level, producing 2,100 ounces of gold to the ton. In today's dollars, that would be roughly $1 million per ore car. The entire ore chimney, one of the richest in the Tintic district, produced 1.3 million tons of high-grade ore at a present value of $272 million. Today, one can view the remains of the Big Four, which at that time comprised the Gemini ore run. Often piercing the surface, this one and a half mile high grade series of ore chimneys produced over a billion dollars in today's values. While perhaps a little less dramatic in its development, a steady riser in Utah mining was the coal camps of eastern Utah. Utah has been richly blessed with low sulfur, high quality coal reserves, which underlie much of southeastern Utah. More accessible in the rocky incline thrust of Carbon and Emory counties, the major coal mining camps form a carbon crescent of activity. Like other metal mining camps, the early discoveries attracted coal miners from Europe, Scandinavia, and the British Isles. Major ethnic groups included the Greeks, Slovenians, Italians, and the Finns. Unlike the older residents of Utah who came here seeking their Zion, these new immigrants did not call Utah home and planned to make their money and return to their homelands. Following the establishment of winter quarters, other coal camps followed. Castlegate, Clear Creek, and Sunnyside by 1900, and all owned by the Denver Rio Grande Western Railroad. Following the breakup of the railroad monopolies in 1908, other camps opened. Kenilworth, Hiawatha, Stores, Standardville, Rains, Wattis, Consumers, Columbia, and Dragerton. The company town, like this one, was typical of many company towns in Utah. The store, the church, the entertainment center, a place for the ball team, and rows of company houses. The superintendent and foreman lived in the bigger homes. The company doctor also often had the nicest home in town. This row of homes, belonging to the company bosses, was known as Silk Stocking Row. Takanas, Dimitri. Thank you. Dovizania. Dovizania, Mrs. Jeliznansky. Dovizania. In a typical mining camp, it wasn't at all uncommon to find several languages spoken. The company store was a gathering place for many a mining camp. You worked in the mines, you lived in the company housing, and you shopped at the company store. Masalama, Mr. Malouf. The company store was generally well stocked. Company script was issued, and the miners' pay was simply docked for housing, groceries, and other incidentals. Now, some considered this to be unfair to the miners. But on the other hand, if you consider the remoteness of the mines and the difficulties of transportation of the time, it was mighty convenient. Different languages were as common as English. In fact, at one time, there were 27 different languages spoken here in Helper. The towns even had their town jail. Here at Hiawatha, the jail was built by an Italian stonemason. Felice Giuliotti completed the jail here at Hiawatha, and then to celebrate, entered the saloon and offered to buy drinks for everyone. Two Americans announced that they would not drink with a blankety-blank Italian. The highly insulted Giuliotti started a fight with the two, and as a result, he is credited not only with building the Hiawatha jail, 
but also as being its first occupant. The immigrants wrote their families and urged them to come make their fortune in the Utah coal fields. Clear Creek attracted a large Finnish community, and it was here that an unusual tragedy unfolded. Abe Luma and his wife arrived in Schofield from Finland in February 1900 at the urging of their seven sons who were working at the Winter Quarters coal mine. The boys wanted them to spend their golden years with them because they were doing well. At 10.28 on the morning of May 1st, a terrific explosion was heard by the residents of Clear Creek and Schofield. At first, the residents thought it was a celebration blast for Dewey Day. But it soon became apparent that the blast came from the mine. It took five days to recover the bodies. The Winter Quarters disaster claimed 200 lives, one of the worst mining tragedies in U.S. history. Death for the miners came by one of three means. The explosion itself, falling coal and debris from the explosion, and the after damp, or lack of oxygen from the explosion. Salt Lake City could only provide 125 coffins. The rest were shipped in from Denver. Of the 200 dead, 62 were Finnish. Of the seven sons of Abe Luma, only one, Matejo, survived. Six sons and three grandsons perished in the explosion. Two services were held, one conducted by a Finnish Lutheran minister from Wyoming, and the other by the LDS church apostles, George Teasdale, Reed Smoot, and Heber J. Grant. The Pleasant Valley Coal Company paid funeral expenses, erased thousands of dollars in company store debts, and provided $500 to the family of each man killed. It was a fairly generous sum then, as the average daily wage was $3. The mine reopened on May 28th. In addition to the big company mines, coal was mined as a family operation for home or business heating. Another purpose was to make coking coal for the steel industry. At Sunnyside, these coking ovens were begun in 1902. The coal was roasted in the ovens and then shipped to smelters to provide the heat necessary in processing steel and other metals. These beehive-shaped ovens eventually numbered 800. Today, only the foundations remain of this once thriving industry. The mines and numbers of miners increased as World War I efforts made their demands. By 1919, prices fell. The unions made renewed efforts to organize. As the daily wage dropped from $7.95 to five and a quarter, union activity increased. On April 1, 1922, coal miners in Carbon County joined the largest coal strike in the nation. Security increased as hostilities mounted. High on this hill above Sunnyside, the machine gun emplacement is still visible. A powerful searchlight was backed by a machine gun to enforce curfew and illuminate strike breakers. Martial law was finally declared in June after sporadic incidents of gunfire, murder, and growing unrest. By August, a settlement was reached and the strike was over. Mining activity resumed at over 20 locations in the Carbon Crescent. But it still wasn't steady work. We work for a day or two and then be off for three or four. We couldn't go anywhere. No one had a car and we didn't have any money. Life in the coal camps was good, but the times were tough. We used to go downtown to pick up our mail and sit on the hotel steps. About 15 or 20 people would be there. This gentleman comes up the street with a nice big load of watermelons. Just got these in from Green River. Expect yours for nickel. Would you believe it or not, there was not a nickel in that crowd? 
Nada. You boys are worse off than I thought. Tell you what, it's on me. So he gave us one and we uh, shared it and cut it up and everyone had a piece of watermelon. There you go. My pleasure. That was one of the best pieces of watermelon I ever remember eating. Then, without warning, another tragedy struck at the Castlegate mine. The mine was not being worked every day. The men who answered the work call on Saturday, March 8, 1924, considered themselves fortunate. Priority for work was given to the married men. Benjamin Thomas, the Mormon bishop of Castle Gate, had just begun working as a coal miner. It was his third day. On Saturday morning, he had a feeling that he should not go to work. He mentioned it to his wife, Verzilla, and decided to stay home. But the Thomases had a son serving a mission for the church. They needed the money for him, and reluctantly, Benjamin decided to go to work after all. He was the last man to catch the man trip into the portal. An hour into the morning shift, methane gas was ignited by a miner's lamp. A second explosion ignited coal dust, and so powerful was the blast that the main tunnel acted as a rifle barrel. Timbers and rails were blown 5,000 feet across two canyons. A twisted coal car, identical to cars in the Castle Gate mine and weighing a half ton, was found on this hillside high above the canyon floor. Its location suggests that the only way it got there was that it was blown from the Castle Gate portal on that fateful morning. Several markers in the Castle Gate Cemetery reflect the tragedy of that day. I little thought when they left home that they would near return. That day in death so soon would sleep and leave me all alone. 45 Americans, 50 Greeks, 25 Italians, 32 English and Scots, 12 Welshmen, 4 Japanese, and 3 Slovenians perished, leaving 114 widows in a total of 415 dependents and 25 yet unborn children. The safety measures learned from Castle Gate and Winter Quarters helped the national coal industry never to repeat again the tragedies experienced in Utah. Meanwhile, as coal mining picked up and continued to prosper, let's just back up a bit and talk about what happened to that growing mining town up Bingham Canyon. From 1848 to 1886, there were moderate amounts of gold, silver, and lead removed from the West Mountain Mining District. Copper was evident. In fact, it was evident almost everywhere. But it was too finely intermeshed with the rock that held it together. It was called porphyry copper. Enos Wall, whose residence on South Temple is now the LDS Business College, had had some successes in Silver Reef. He began to recognize the potential values at Bingham Canyon and slowly began acquiring eventually 200 acres of copper property, forsaken by others as worthless mining claims. His copper-bearing rocks were referred to as wall rocks. Meanwhile, Samuel Newhouse and Thomas Weir purchased Bingham's Highland Boy gold mine. In its further development, they discovered ore bodies of copper. With Newhouse's financial connections, the additional capital was attracted and a modern copper smelter was placed in production in 1899. After it was successfully producing copper, William Rockefeller and the Standard Oil Company purchased control of the operation and formed Utah Consolidated Mining Company. The name was later changed to Boston Consolidated Mining Company. Wall, in the meantime, attracted the interest of a Captain Joseph R. De Lamar, who owned the Golden Gate Mill in Merker. De Lamar hired a man by the name of Daniel Jackling, a young Missouri School of Mines metallurgical engineer, to assess Wall's property values. With a value of only 40 pounds, or 2% copper to the ton of ore, this porphyry copper presented a challenge. At the time, 10% was the minimum standard for profitability. 
Jackling felt he could process the low-grade copper profitably by concentrating on volume. With this process, it would be profitable to dig from the surface rather than following veins in drifts, as volume would be the key to its success. His interest in drive helped attract the money to purchase the property from Wall and begin an experimental processing plant at Copperton. In 1903, the Utah Copper Company was formed. The Guggenheims became involved, and the Sarco, or American Smelting and Refining Company, became a part owner. As a result of opportunity and ingenuity, Daniel Jackling pioneered surface mining, which would later evolve to open pit mining. As early as the 1870s, shacks and shanties sprang up in Bingham Canyon. The canyon dwellings increased to a few hundred, and by 1904, Bingham Canyon was incorporated. In 1905, Samuel Newhouse's Boston Consolidated began digging with large steam shovels. Two months later, steam shovels left over from the Panama Canal diggings were purchased by Utah Copper to begin removal of overburden, exposing the low-grade copper ore. With large-scale open pit mining, immigrants from all over the world came to this burgeoning mining town. The hill, as it was named, would gradually disappear into the largest man-made excavation on Earth. By 1912, houses were stacked on the canyon slopes and in the gullies wherever they could fit. The mines employed 5,000 workers and 40 nationalities were represented. Fully 65% of the population was foreign-born. The workers included Albanians, Armenians, Austrians, Basques, Bulgarians, Chinese, Croats, Czechs, Danes, Dutch, English, Finns, French, Germans, Greeks, Hungarians, Irish, Italians, Japanese, Koreans, Macedonians, Mexicans, Montenegrins, native-born Americans, Norwegians, Poles, Russians, Scots, Serbs, Slovaks, Slovenians, Spaniards, Swiss, Swedes, and Turks. as a young child, the many ethnic groups, that Bingham Canyon was no melting pot. The foreigners tended to keep within their own groups and perpetuate their own customs. Its three burgs were the most cosmopolitan towns in Utah, if not in the entire West. Frogtown was named because of the French Canadians living there who enjoyed eating frog legs. High on the hillside was Cooperham, home to a few Irish families. Car Fork was Fintown, with a smattering of Swedes, Norwegians, and Irish. Further up the gulch was Phoenix, or Highland Boy, the realm of 1,200 Southern Slavs and Italians. A short distance up the main canyon, above the confluence of Car Fork, was Upper Bingham, or Greek Town. Each nationality had its own stores and shops. The Greeks turned out fine bakery goods and candies. And at one time, there were five candy stores owned by the Greeks. The Chinese had come to Utah along with the Central Pacific Railroad. Charles Crocker had hired a few hundred Chinese to work on the railroad. But when he discovered how extremely well they took to their labors, he hired them by the thousands, and they were known as Crocker's Pets. This mountain town also challenged the miners' ingenuity in transporting the ore from the mine to the rail depot. The challenge was not so much in getting the loaded wagons down the canyon, it was more in getting the wagons back to the mines. With rain or snow, it was necessary at times to put 20 horses onto each wagon. First came a 20-gauge horse and mule-drawn tram from the old Jordan and Galena mines down to the Rio Grande Depot. The empty cars were hauled back to the mine by mules. As the mines developed, increasing the tonnage requirements, a railroad line became an absolute necessity. The first train chugged over a 30-inch gauge line with a wood-burning dinky engine. The Bingham and Camp Floyd operated for nine years. The Denver and Rio Grande then bought it and converted it to a standard gauge. By 1911, the Bingham and Garfield line connected the mines to the Garfield concentrator and smelter. 
The line took 18 months to build. It traversed the foothills of the Ochre Mountains for 20 miles and crossed over three steel viaducts at Dry Fork, Car Fork, and Markham Gulch with a trestle height of 220 feet. For nearly 50 years, the Bingham and Garfield Line, later called the Utah Copper Railroad, was the largest industrial railroad in the United States. It eventually became apparent that two large mining operations on the same hill could not continue to open pit mine independently. Samuel Newhouse's Boston Consolidated Copper Company had the top of the hill, and Daniel Jackling's Utah Copper Company had the bottom. The companies were merged in 1910, setting the stage for a prolonged period of growth and prosperity. Bingham was huge. It was the largest copper-producing district in America. Nearly 40 mining companies operated here. Utah Copper was the giant. Until now, Bingham had been a non-union district. In the summer of 1912, the Western Federation of Miners successfully organized the district. Discrimination against some ethnic groups by the mining companies and frustration over hiring practices in association with unethical labor agents brought about overwhelming support, especially from the Greek community. On September 18, 1912, the miners struck. Initially, 4,800 workers were idled. It increased to 9,000 workers when it spread to the mills and smelters at Murray, Midvale, Magna, Arthur, and Garfield as the supply of ore and concentrates ended. Tensions increased as the Utah Copper Company attempted to restart mining operations. Armed violence ensued. 800 foreign-born immigrants, mostly Greek, had positioned themselves in the ledges across the canyon, armed with rifles and revolvers. Armed deputies demanded that they give up their arms or be driven out. A standoff maintained an uneasy peace. Then, a remarkable thing happened. Governor Spry had tried to arrange a meeting between striking miners and company officials, but to no avail. Potentially, the worst U.S. industrial civil war was averted when the Greek Orthodox priest from Salt Lake City, Father Vasilios Lambridis, went to Bingham to persuade the armed miners to meet with the governor. He literally walked the dividing line between armed deputies and miners. The little father, dressed in flowing clerical robes, with a glittering cross of gold upon his breast, went among the militant strikers like the spirit of peace and brought the truth of God. Everywhere, guns were laid aside for him, and heads were doffed in respectful salute. The armed camp became a place of peace and goodwill. With few exceptions, the men deserted their trenches, which they had held in defiance of 350 deputies. After grievances were aired and minor skirmishes quelled, the strike ended by November. Recognition of the Union failed but wages were increased. By 1914, the population had grown to 10,000. It doubled again within 10 years. Like many mining towns in Utah, Bingham Canyon weathered fires, floods, avalanches, and human strife. The worst disaster occurred in February 1926. The winter was unusually severe. Beginning on the 14th, it snowed continuously for three days. The snow at Highland Boy was already 25 feet deep. On the morning of the 17th, an avalanche raced two miles down Sap Gulf, 
The McDonald boarding house with 60 miners in their rooms was crushed like a cheap toy. A day and a half later, when the injured and dead were accounted for, 39 men had perished. In 1932, tragedy struck a second blow. In a 10-hour period, fire burned a third of a mile of Car Fork and left 300 people homeless. The Highland Boy fire struck at the height of the Depression, taking 75 homes and a dozen businesses, including the Serbian and Croatian lodges. With no work, the victims left the canyon to seek other employment. The fire had decimated the South Slav community, and Highland Boy would never be the same. Meanwhile, the experimental plant at Copperton was replaced by the Magna Mill near Garfield. Originally named Millstone Point by the pioneers who gathered milling stones here, it was renamed Garfield in honor of a visit from United States President James Garfield. The Garfield smelter, first to handle milled porphyry copper concentrates, was also the largest in the world. Its competitor, the Arthur Mill, owned by the Boston Consolidated Group, was the second largest in the world. Two of the largest mills in the world were a stone's throw from each other. Accordingly, the combined activities of the smelters at Murray, Midvale, and Sandy, which were supplied ore by many other mines in Utah, made the Salt Lake Valley the smelting capital of the United States. Samuel Newhouse, called the father of Utah copper mining, was most responsible for attracting the financial and worldwide interest in the Utah copper industry. The financial acumen of the Guggenheims and the engineering and indomitable leadership of Daniel Jackling, however, made him the Henry Ford of copper mining. His foresight revolutionized mining techniques around the world, and he has also been appropriately named the father of porphyry mining. Methods were constantly improved at the mine. Steam shovels were replaced by electric shovels. Six-yard wooden cars were replaced by rail cars and tracks on the growing terraced amphitheater. By 1935, workers had moved as much earth as had been moved in the construction of the entire Panama Canal. During the World War II years, Kennecott provided nearly one-third of the Allied demands for copper. In 1947, the Bingham and Garfield Railroad was replaced by the Utah Copper Line to more efficiently handle transporting raw materials. In 1948, a new electrolytic plant was constructed to up the capacity of copper production. This same year, electric locomotives replaced the steam locomotives in hauling the ore. Despite Bingham Canyon's resilience in handling the forces of nature, it could not withstand the growing mining operation. Gradually, the enclaves of Bingham Canyon were consumed by the mine itself. The hill was now the pit. A new Utah mining boom was also in the making. In the early 40s, the Manhattan Project of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was created to develop an atomic bomb. The key element was uranium, but it was in short supply. The only known sources were Canada and the Belgian Congo. The United States wanted its own strategic stockpile. In 1948, the first federally controlled, promoted, and supported mineral rush was on. Because of previous vanadium mining activity in the Four Corners region, the prospectors flocked to the area. The government provided how to prospect for uranium books and sold them along with Geiger counters. A $10,000 bonus was paid to those finding a producing claim. The government hauled the ore and built over 900 miles of roads to connect the numerous claims. Rags to riches stories were common. Charlie Steen, a Texas oil geologist, spent two years off and on prospecting. Living out of a small trailer with a wife and four boys, he lived from one grub stake to the next, hoping to find uranium. He located a claim with no surface indication of ore. And when he began a test core drilling, the local prospectors called it Steen's Folly. But then on July 18, 1952, after losing his drill pipe at a depth of 197 feet, he almost offhandedly tested some cores he had drilled. The Geiger counter peaked. Nine miles south of LaSalle in the Big Indian District, Steen found high-grade pitch blend, a mineral high in uranium. After some persuasion, he was able to interest a partner, 
But still, he could not raise sufficient money to sink enough drill holes to prove the claim. He decided to gamble and sink a less costly shaft. After two months of drilling and mucking sandstone, they hit pitch blend at 68 feet, a 14-foot thickness of high-grade ore. It was the richest discovery in the entire Colorado Plateau. Uranium was discovered in several locations around Moab. Years earlier, it had been discovered near Marysville, just across the valley and within eyesight of the Gold Mountain Mine. In the new uranium boom, Marysville uranium accounted for a few million dollars worth, but nothing compared to the values near Moab. Charlie Steen's discovery of the Mi Vida mine, which is Spanish for my life, fueled the fire for prospecting. Literally thousands of prospectors were combing the hills of eastern and southern Utah. It was the biggest mining and prospecting boom since the rush days of California and Alaska. In the mid-1950s, almost 600 producers on the Colorado Plateau were shipping uranium ore. The Atomic Energy Commission paid out nearly $4 million in bonuses. The bigger frenzy was not in Moab, however, but on the Penny Stock Exchange in Salt Lake City. Atlas, Federal, Lisbon, Apache, and many other uranium mines were hot tickets. A penny stock went to 50 cents in a matter of days. Speculation was rampant. By the end of June 1954, 81 uranium companies were listed with the Utah Securities Commission, or the SEC. But only a handful of the companies had as much as a whiff of ore. Moab was touted the uranium capital of the world. McCall's magazine claimed Moab was the richest town in the USA. 20 millionaires for every 250 citizens. When the dust finally settled, other discoveries in the United States and reductions in estimated government demands gradually spelled the demise of the uranium industry in Utah. The boom and bust days of mining in Utah may be over, but the industry continues to flourish and in some rather unique and dramatic ways. The old line producers continue to produce steadily. Limestone, one of the key ingredients in cement, is mined at Devil's Slide, east of Morgan, and near Nephi, Delta, and Grantsville. It is crushed and heated in these huge rotary kilns, and then mixed proportionately. The cement powder is then added to sand and gravel, also found abundantly in Utah. Roads and building construction require the rock, sand, and gravel from the quarries which dot the state. Ute light, a special lightweight aggregate, is taken from the hills east of Colville. This special product is a fired or heated shale, which, when added to concrete building materials, provides strength with lighter weight. Constructed inland as a wartime precaution in the early 40s, Geneva Steel was the single largest American wartime construction project. Much of the steel for warships came from this huge facility, which was constructed in a record 18 months. The Geneva plant was located here because of the coking coal at Sunnyside and Horse Canyon, and because of the iron ore from Iron Mountain, west of Cedar City, where it was first discovered by the early settlers in 1851. So crucial was this facility that armed guards were placed at the mines to ensure uninterrupted service to Geneva. The iron ore west of Cedar City is the richest iron ore deposit in the western United States. A high-grade sample contains more than 60% iron. More than 100 million tons of it has been taken from Iron Mountain. the heat and coke for steel processing continues to be supplied from western coal fields. 3,500 tons of it every day. 
In addition, Utah coal is sold to markets in the West and in Asia and is the chief ingredient in our power plants. Many Utah power plants, including the Intermountain Power Project, along with other power plants in Nevada and California, rely on our Utah coal. Visiting a coal mining operation today is an experience. You simply hop in a pickup truck and drive in, sometimes two or three miles into the mountain, at which point you meet a highly skilled and trained crew removing tons and tons of coal. Special equipment called continuous miners chew the coal from the seam. It is then transported to conveyance systems by either continuous haulage equipment or special mining cars. In fact, the continuous mining machine used worldwide was invented by Harold Silver, originally from Salt Lake City. What once required days and extensive manpower is now accomplished in minutes. Powerful fans on the surface provide continuous fresh air currents which are directed to the working area by using walls and curtains underground. Regular monitoring of methane gases, airflow, and the dusting of walls with powdered lime keep the safety factor underground at record levels. The lime on the walls is why these black coal seams appear white in the headlights of the truck. A unique characteristic of Utah coal mines is the dinosaur footprints in the ceiling. Thousands of footprints have been uncovered in the mining processes. Some even have to be bolted to the roof to prevent possible injury to miners. Perhaps the most dramatic coal mining technique today is the long wall miner. This machine is literally a series of hydraulic shields which work together to hold up the roof. The long wall machine advances forward and provides a safe environment for the miner as tons of coal a minute are removed with a huge coal chewing auger. Utilized in a few mines in Utah, this particular one at the Skyline Mine just above the old Winter Quarters Mine is 720 feet wide and removes a seam of coal 7,000 feet long, 13 feet high, and with a bite three feet deep on each pass. It is manned by just seven men. The productivity per man hour is in a class by itself. Along with a greater sense of environmental awareness, reseeding and revegetation efforts at the coal mines and clean air scrubbers at the power plants make coal mining one of the least obtrusive industries in Utah. Perhaps one of the more unique mining operations today is at Bonanza, Utah. Here, gilsonite is found in four to eight foot wide seams sandwiched between light colored sandstone. It is not a horizontal seam, but a vertical seam, which demands a different style of mining. The seams are mined with shafts sunk periodically, and workers advance toward each other, working on an incline. The pyramid-shaped face is chipped with an air hammer and the gilsonite falls by gravity to the bottom of the hill, where it is sucked up by a powerful vacuum to the surface. It is sold around the world for use in paints, inks, and coatings, and has the distinction of being the only place in the world where it is mined. Another exclusive mining activity is north of Delta at the Brush Wellman Beryllium Mine. Beryllium is used in high-strength, low-weight metal alloys, such as is needed for the space industry. Utah's beryllium mine is the only one in the United States. Gold, literally found over the entire state of Utah, it embodies the mystique and the allure of mining. With patience, most any stream will yield a grain or two, from the San Rafael River to Bingham Canyon, it has been sluiced, panned, and dug from the Earth's very tight grasp. A century ago, productive mineral claims were often discovered by prospectors who located these deposits with a gold pan. And sometimes, the gold in the stream led the prospector to the mother lode. The process of panning and potato assaying was one method of discovering economic placer gold deposits. 
Prospector first worked the creek bottom looking for gravel bars where heavy metals such as gold would drop out of the flow of the current. He then loaded the pan with gravel and rotated it vigorously in the stream current. This removed the lighter grain materials. The pan was worked for up to 45 minutes to finally reveal the heavier materials, hopefully gold or silver. The remaining fine grain gold and silver mixed with heavy black sands had to be separated with mercury. The prospectors learned that a teaspoon of mercury rolled around in the bottom of the gold pan physically picked up all of the fine grain gold and silver leaving the black sands behind. This mixture of gold, silver and mercury is called amalgam. In order to liberate the gold and silver, the amalgam required heat. Often miles away from any town or assay office, the prospectors heated the amalgam over a campfire. Many old prospectors died of mercury poisoning from the heated vapors. Someone discovered that a common potato, baked in the fire with the amalgam inside, would absorb the vapors, making it safer for the prospector. The potato was easily hollowed out and then sealed back together with the amalgam secured in the carved out cavity. After the baked potato had cooled, the spud was opened and the gold and silver liberated. This crude but effective technique has been replaced by much safer spectrophotometry. Once a claim proved to be profitable, a stamp milling operation was employed, often very near to the mine location. Crude by today's standards, these stamp mills were indicative of the size of the mine. Anywhere from three stamp to 25 stamp mills were operated at numerous sites around the state. The principle was simple enough. The pre-crushed ore was hoppered into the mill and these weighted rods were forced upward by pulley-driven cams. The free-falling up and down motion of the heavy rods crushed the ore. And the resulting powder oozed through fine meshed screens and was carried by water to a shaker table. The water, together with the vibrating motion, allowed the lighter weight material to be carried off, leaving the heavier black sand. This rather ingenious process readied the gold and silver bearing material for further processing at a smelter. Often when the mine played out, the mills were dismantled and moved to a newer and more profitable mine location. Gold is still mined in Utah. West of St. George, USMX, or the Gold Strike Mine, produces over 40,000 ounces a year. Gone are the days of seven ounce nuggets. Each of these trucks carries 85 tons of ore containing one ounce of gold. Safely controlled and monitored, the gold ore is piled into stacks called leach pads, and a weak cyanide solution is sprayed onto it. The gold is carried in solution to these ponds, where it is recovered and processed. The Merker Gold Mine resumed operations in 1983. There is no town to rise from the ashes of 1902, but the activities today far surpass the activities of the bustling town before the fire. If one could ascribe the Phoenix rising again, it would be to the weekly gold pour of these Doré gold bars. Merker today is an open pit mining operation which produces over 110,000 ounces of gold annually. The most recent and largest producing gold mine to enter the Utah mining picture is Barney's Canyon, adjacent to the Bingham Mine. Again, placer mining and gold nuggets have been replaced by open pit volume production, the key to which has unlocked the wealth of the Ochre Mountains. Once the Doré bars have been poured at the mine site, they are further processed at other locations, some here in Utah.
fine product is nothing less than spectacular. Utah has its share of salt. Thousands of acres of it above and below the ground. West of Moab lies one of the nation's largest underground salt reserves, 11,000 square miles of it. Here in the Paradox Basin, the potash-bearing salt is removed by pumping river water into the ground, dissolving the salt, and then pumping the brine to the surface, where it is evaporated in solar ponds. Visually dramatic in this beautiful red rock desert setting, it is estimated that there is enough potash in the underground salt reservoir to supply the entire world for 500 years. The very first mining activity after the arrival of the pioneers in 1847 was extraction of salt from the lake west of Salt Lake City. The surface mining of salt continues today. The Great Salt Lake holds other minerals as well. Controlled evaporation takes place to mine the potash from the brine salts. On a hot day, 100 billion gallons of water will evaporate from the 20,000 acres of ponds. It is through this controlled evaporation that harvesting of minerals takes place. In addition to potash, or potassium sulfate, which is a fertilizer, more than a million tons of salt or sodium chloride is harvested. Magnesium chloride, which is used as a de-icer, and sodium sulfate, a detergent filler, are also part of the harvest. The next time you drink a can of soda pop, chances are the magnesium part of the aluminum magnesium alloy which makes that can came from the water in the Great Salt Lake. This huge salty lake provides one of only two locations in the entire United States where magnesium is produced. Through a process of evaporation and flash drying of brine concentrates, and then an anode cathode process within the heated brine salts, magic is performed. Magnesium is scooped off the heated solution and poured into huge ingots, then shipped off to manufacturers around the world. After more than a century of continuous mining, Arc City ceased active mining operations in 1982. One often hears of the fame of the Comstock in Virginia City and of its fabulous wealth. Its total values were $300 million, or about $1.5 billion in today's dollars. The combined values of the Park City District have exceeded two and three quarter billion dollars, nearly double that of the Comstock load. It might be interesting to note that in this silver city, more values have been removed in lead than in silver. Today's wealth lies not on the 1,000 plus miles of drifts and adits under Park City, but in the incredible wealth on the surface. The original lake flat is now surrounded by the condos and guest facilities of Deer Valley. Home of the U.S. Olympic ski team, Park City boasts one of the nation's successful year-round destination resorts. Today, the mine buildings and dumps offer only a reminder to the gondola riding skier of days gone by, preserved by a photograph of the name of a ski run. Through old photographs and aerial topographic maps, modern technology gives us a glimpse of what Park City and its mines might have looked like at the turn of the century.
And while Park City staked its claim as one of the great silver districts of North America, an even bigger producer was the Tintic Mining District. In today's dollars, the combined values of gold, silver, copper, and lead production in and around Eureka exceeded $4 billion. But the Utah granddaddy of them all, in fact, one of the granddaddies of the world, is the Bingham Canyon Copper Mine. Described by one writer as the richest hole on earth, and by another as old reliable, Bingham Canyon continues to produce, as it has done, almost continuously since 1906. Technology and productivity have not only made this two and a half mile wide and one half mile deep amphitheater the single largest human excavation on Earth, but also one of the most productive. Innovation has cut the cost of production by three quarters over the past 10 years, making it one of the most efficient facilities in the world. It's difficult to describe the feeling of being at the bottom of the largest excavation on Earth. Picture this, if you will. If you were to stack seven LDS church office buildings, one on top of the other, they barely would reach the top. And at the top, you could place 44 football fields end to end. And that's two and a half miles across. And the pit continues to grow. It's estimated that in 20 years, this place will be 650 feet deeper than it is today. This mine has produced more copper than any other mine in world history. More than 5 billion tons of material have been mined, producing more than 14 million tons of copper. In order to meet demand, 156,000 tons of copper ore and 138,000 tons of waste rock are removed every day. Daniel Jackling first calculated that 2,000 tons a day would be required to make porphyry copper a viable mining concern. The largest of these huge electric shovels scoops 70 tons at a bite, or the equivalent weight of 35 automobiles. Sitting over three stories above ground, the shovel operator loads these huge trucks in less than a minute. The really big trucks hold 240 tons of material. Just to give you a perspective of size, I'm over six feet tall, but I really feel insignificant standing next to this monstrous truck tire. And talk about mobility. This fleet of 43 trucks can travel 6,800 miles in one day in combination, and that's only at the speed of 15 miles an hour. Open pit mining is much different than underground coal or hard rock mining. The men work on huge terraces as the pit grows wider and deeper. Once the higher grade ore is located from test holes, it is drilled and blasted, 180,000 tons at a time. Once loaded, some of these trucks haul the overburden away, and other trucks haul the ore to the crusher, where it is broken to the size of a basketball or smaller. It is then transported on this five-mile conveyor belt, where it is stockpiled for the concentrator. These huge sag and ball mills crush the low-grade ore, less than 1% copper at this point. The resulting powder, fine as face powder, is then mixed with reagents, and the copper-bearing minerals float to the surface in these flotation cells. At this point, it is 28% copper. The liquid concentrate is then pumped 17 miles to the Garfield smelter, where heat dries, separates, and then melts the concentrate, some 250,000 tons of it per year. At this point, iron and sulfur are removed. With the new smelter and refinery under construction, sulfur dioxide emissions, already low by world standards, will become the lowest and therefore cleanest smelting operation in the world. 
The melted copper is then poured into anodes and is now 98% copper. The anode is then placed into a mild acid solution and electricity is added to begin a 14-day process of migration to a pure copper sheet called a cathode. When removed, this 330-pound cathode plate is 99.98% pure copper. The sheer volume produced here is impressive. Nearly a million of these copper plates, or 160,000 tons of copper, are produced each year. A leader in U.S. copper production, Kennecott is also second in molybdenum, third in silver, and seventh in the United States in gold production. Over 400,000 ounces, more than all of the Utah gold mines combined. And as an additional byproduct, over 3 million ounces of silver. Considering the productivity over the past century in gold, silver, zinc, lead, molybdenum, copper, and a number of rare earths, the present-day values are many, many times that of all Utah mines combined. Because these mountains were the first to reflect the sunrise, the Paiute Indians called them ochre, or the shining mountains. When one considers the mining activity of Merker and Ophir on the west side of the Ochres, and Barney's and Bingham Canyon on the east, this 30-mile formation vies as one of the richest mountain ranges in the world. The largest, the widest, the biggest, the most impressive, these are the terms that are appropriately used to describe the immensity of the Bingham Canyon copper mine. And while it may be the biggest and the most impressive, it truly is just a representation of the great history of mining in the state of Utah. From the heart-rending to the humorous, from the impossible to the practical, from the innovative to the incredibly productive, Utah mining is history in action. The total monetary value of this industry can only be measured in billions of dollars. But what cannot be measured in dollars is the rich heritage and historical legacy that mining has given to the state of Utah. And Utah has contributed its share of wealth to the country. It seems that Abraham Lincoln's prophecy has come true. Utah has been and will continue to be a treasure house to the nation.